So we'll start with our first speaker, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Rob Hindman. So Rob is uh, one of the associate investigators in our Centre of Excellence in ASIMS, uh, and he's a valued member of the, the centre. Uh, he's a professor of statistics in the Department of in Econometrics and um, Business Statistics at Monash University. He's director of the Monash University Business and Economic Forecasting Unit, and he's also editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Forecasting and a director of the International Institute of Forecasters. Rob is an author of over 100 research papers in statistical science, and in 2007 he received the Moran Medal uh, for, from the Australian Academy of Science for his contributions to statistical research, especially in the area of statistical forecasting. For 25 years, he's maintained an active consulting practice, assisting hundreds of companies and organisations. His recent consulting work has involved forecasting electricity demand, tourism demand, the Australian Government Health Budget and case volume at a US call centre. So as Jared Manley Hopkins said, here we are, we're about to dive, fall, gall, and gash gold vermilion. So I'll hand it over to Rob. Thanks, Kerry, and it's a great pleasure to um, be able to be part of this workshop. I think I'm a little bit of the warm-up act because I don't feel like I do really big data compared to some of the other people that will follow, so I'm going to do sort of big-ish data. Um, and so my, my first, first couple of slides are some of the examples of the big-ish time series data that I, that I work with. Um, so the first one is to do with Australian tourism demand, and I'll use this as an example throughout the talk. Um, the Australian tourism demand is of interest in tourism planning and it's collected quarterly. So the thing is with time series you can never get very big data uh, over time because there isn't that much time to collect data over if you're doing it quarterly or monthly or even daily. Um, so the, the bigness comes usually in the number of time series. In this case there's only a few hundred. So it's, uh, it's collected down to regional level in Australia. So it's split up by states and then by zones and then by regions to create this geographical hierarchy and it's also split by purpose of travel. So we have 304 time series plus various aggregations of them for different regions of Australia. Then we have uh, another example I've been working with is the... Um, I need to turn my phone off so it doesn't come up like that. Then we have uh, examples of uh, labour market participation. So. The Australian government likes to forecast the number of people we need in different occupations in Australia. There's about a thousand different occupations in their classification. So for example, statisticians are classified under professionals, eight such, there's eight major groups, professionals is one of them. Within professionals, we are under business, human resource and marketing professionals and under that we're information and organisation professionals, and then within the category of actuaries, mathematicians and statisticians. And finally, at the fifth level down, we are statistician, one of 1,023 occupations in Australia. You want to forecast all of these different occupations simultaneously in a way that's consistent. Again, that's not very big, only um, 1,000 series. And we have that monthly going back a long time. And my third example, which is getting a little bit bigger, is a company I'm working with um, who uh, manufactures spectacles and they have data from 2000 to 2014 on a monthly basis and they're interested in um, their sales by different types of brand, by gender, that's male, female or non-specific, different price ranges, different materials and 600 stores in the UK. So there's about a million bottom level series, um, million time series when you do the complete disaggregation. And we want to forecast those in a way that's consistent across the entire range of, um, of series. So that's getting a little bigger. And I'm working with a couple of other companies that have in the order of 1 million to 3 million time series that they want to forecast or, or analyse in some way. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is, well, how do you actually try to visualise series when you've got so many of them? You can't just do time plots when you've got a million time plots to look at. You, you're not going to be able to even see what's going on. So let me just talk a little bit about some uh, early work that I've done. None of this is published, 
uh, just thinking about how do you do it. Um, first of all, if we, do, if we do only have a few hundred series, we might want to plot them over time, but the lines get so small that you can't see them, so we need to thicken them up a little bit. If the data are all positive, uh, then we can um, flip them around the horizontal axis and create solid colours, which are easier to see when you start reducing down the size. So we call these kite diagrams. So we take the, the, the series, flip it around the axis, and then fill in the, the um, between them with solid colour to give it a little bit something easier to see. Again, only is going to work, it's only going to work with positive numbers, but mostly I'm dealing with sales, which tend to be positive. So here's um, a few of the series for the Victorian tourism data. Uh, so just looking at the state of Victoria, and we have on the, this axis here the purpose of travel, and on the other axis, regions. And uh, you can see that this... And they're on the same scale. So uh, you can see that the first region is dominant, that's Melbourne. Uh, if, we re if we... So we're looking for those of you who are not from Australia. This is Victoria down here. Um, and the, there's the regional labels that the government uses. So BAA, which is Melbourne, is here. And the, B, uh, the other B regions, BA regions are the southern coast, and then it's got the BE and BD and so on. If we rescale it, you start seeing some interesting things. We see some trends. So this increasing width indicates a trend. We see seasonality. See so these plots here have this pulse happening, that's seasonality. Um, you can see that relatively easily. Um, you see outliers, so this series here, so this is BCC and it's business and we have an, some kind of strange month when we had a lot of visitors to that particular region. It's probably a business convention, a large business convention held in a rural region so there was suddenly a lot of people there but not usually. You have another similar outlier just here. So you can see a little bit once you start looking at these series but again it's not scalable. We can't move to a thousand series or a million series in this way. Also, it's a little limited in what you can't really see, for example, in these seasonal series, when the peak is. So let's have a look at what we can do there. First of all, we do an STL decomposition of all of the series. So STL decomposition means you split the data into three components, a seasonal component, which is periodic, a trend component, which is smooth, and the rest goes into the remainder. We're going to take the seasonal component and, and look at it. So if we take the seasonal component for each of the series, place the positive values above the origin, negative below, we can get graphs like this, where now each bar represents one series. And we start looking for interesting features. You can see, for example, that Melbourne, which is BAA, is the least seasonal of the regions. Makes sense, people go there all year round. We can see that for these regions here, the positive quarter one is the strong people are going there in quarter one. They're the beach um, regions. But there's one that stands out which is different from all the others, which is this one, where it has a relatively strong quarter three, and that is region BDC. And if we go to our map, um, we'll see that that's this region here, which is the only place in Victoria where you can go skiing. Um, so you can start seeing things that make sense in the data. Um, you, you've got a, a, a winter holiday um, activity happening in that region, but not in the other ones. OK, what else can we do? We can look at the remainder series and say, well, is there, are there relationships between the series by looking at the remainders from the STL decomposition? What's that going to tell us? It's going to tell us if there's relationships that cannot be explained simply by trend and seasonal um, patterns. And it's interesting to, to look and see why this might occur. So if we compute the correlations among all the remainders and then map them in a, in a um, matrix like this where they're ordered by the first principal component of the correlations, see nothing much at all. Just looks like a random um, scatter of points. And I, I could not detect any patterns. But if I took another state, say Tasmania, did the same thing there. We see something very strongly happening. We see all these positive correlations between regions. This is holiday traffic uh, in, in Tasmania. 
That suggests that in Tasmania, people are moving between regions on holidays. So after taking out seasonality, after taking out trend, there's still relationships which suggest that there's, there's people moving between regions in Tasmania, but they're not doing that in Victoria. In Victoria, people are going on holidays to one place and then coming home. In Tasmania, they're going on holidays and travelling around. So you start seeing things in the series that you might not otherwise see. So you'll see what's happened here is we've gone from looking at the time plots to looking at features where, of the series where we're, each time series becomes the unit of observation. And that's the trick to scaling this up. As long as each series becomes its own unit of observation and we look at it as a, as a holistic whole, rather than trying to plot the individual values of the series, we can do some analysis, we can do some visualisation that is scalable to large sets of data. The next thing I thought to do was, well, if, if we take that idea of summarising time series by their features, and then we study the features rather than the time series themselves, we can, we can start spotting some patterns that might not otherwise be obvious. So I came up with a bunch of features we might look at. The strength of trend. Is it a strong or a weak trend? Um, how lumpy the series is, which we, can, which we estimate by taking the, the um, annual remainders, um, so that we take the variance of the annual remainders and take their variances. So if you've got a lot, lot of variation in those, you're going to see some lumpiness. The strength of seasonality, the size of the seasonal peak, the size of the trough, the ACF of the data, the first lag, how linear the trend is, how, how quadratically curved the trend is, and then spectral entropy, which is a measure of forecastability of the time series. And then we take a PC principal component analysis on this set of features. Forget the original observations, we now just deal with the features as our observations. And so here's the first two principal components, which explains um, about 60% of the data. And we see some interesting things. We see these two arms. And on this arm, it's about lumpiness and spikiness. And on this arm, it's about seasonality. So if we take, the, uh, take this arm to start with, let's look at the first four of those um, series. So the numbers given are the numbers, are the index of the series in my um, big matrix. So there's the first four. And sure enough, they're spiky. So one of the, these dimensions here are the individual variables. The spiky and the lumpy variables are in this direction, so straight up that spike. And so sure enough, they're picking out the outliers in the spikiness. And if we look at the, which regions these are, we'll find that they're um, country regions. The first two are country regions in Victoria, which had large, large business conventions, so it created this huge spike. This is very useful if you're looking for anomalous series and outliers and weird things going on. And if you've got a million series, it's completely scalable. You just have a million points here. You can still look for outliers in that space. You can find anomalous things going on that you couldn't see otherwise. Um, if we take the other axis, which is this one, we're looking at these the four biggest seri uh, most outlying series in this direction, which is the most outlyingness in terms of seasonality and we find with these series here. So um, this is a series ADA, which is a, uh, A is New South Wales, and so that's one of the New South Wales um, coastal regions. This is BDC, BBA, so these two are Victorian ones. This is a Victorian coastal region. This is a Victorian um, uh, winter snow region, and this is another New South Wales country um, coastal region. So that's picking out the strong seasonalities um, from the rest of the series. So I'm working with another company that's doing, uh, we're looking at web mail and trying to find anomalous uh, amounts of traffic on their web servers, on their mail servers. And they have about a, several million uh, observations on mail servers and uh, this is extremely useful for finding the most you know, anomalous series, where, where the trouble spots are that need to be addressed. Um, if I take the same principal components and plot them uh, overlaid by the state, we see the states are in fact different on these series. Um, so for example, this arm here, which was the spiky arm, remember, 
Northern Territory doesn't have any spiky behaviour, neither does Tasmania, neither does Western Australia. The spikiness tends to happen in Victoria and to some extent Queensland. On the other arm, which was the seasonal arm, um, again you see some differences, although not quite so pronounced, but the most seasonal series is here in New South Wales. I could overlay it by purpose of travel and you see that the spikiness is coming almost entirely through business and other, but nothing in, no seasonality in business or other method, other purposes of travel, whereas the seasonality is all in holidays. So you can start seeing, um, when you use overlays of colours on these plots, you can see other things going on. Before I leave that, let me just show you one more thing. Um, so here I have the same, um, the same principal components, but plotted in uh, three dimensions instead of two. And if I rotate it in the right direction, you'll see that there's actually three arms here, not two, like there. Okay, so you've got, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like that in, um, in 3D space. And you've got a seasonal arm, you've got a spiky arm, you've got this other arm as well, which you can see when you start rotating things in three dimensions. Um, so these sort of visualisations are also useful. Okay, so that's sort of the first part of what I wanted to say, is start thinking about time series as, as their own unit of observation, and then you can start doing some interesting visualisations that are scalable. The examples I've shown you are only about 300 series, so it's not very big, but they ask, I have tried them on, on much larger sets and it does scale up quite well. Okay, oops, I've done that bit. Okay, let me go to the second part of what I want to talk about today, which is um, forecasting. How do you forecast such large sets of data in a way that are consistent? So I call this um, bluff or best linear unbiased forecast. This part of it is it's published. I'll give you some references later. So in the, in the tourism example, we were interested in splitting the data up by state and then by... Um, zone and then by region. And a lot of time series are like that. You split and split and split as you disaggregate down. So the um, labour market example is like that. You split by professionals and then by subgroups and then by sub-subgroups until you get down to the most disaggregated level. Um, and it happen happens very frequently. If I think about what a hierarchical time series looks like, let me try to introduce some notation to help understand what's going to follow. If I let y be the observed aggregate of all series at time t, that's y sub t, and then an observation on a node within the tree, I'll call y sub x comma t. And then at the bottom level, the most disaggregated level, I'll, I'll label that b, bold face b, for the bottom level vector. So in this very simple hierarchy, which consists of just three disaggregated series and one total, I can write it like this the total, and then the three series down here. Um, and that can be written as a matrix times the bottom level series. So this is a summing matrix which shows how you add up the bottom level series to get the high ones further up the, up the tree. In this very simple example, the total is just the sum of these three, and then below that you've just got the individual series. So we write it as y, the vector of all the data in the hierarchy, is S times B, summing matrix times bottom level. Here's a slightly bigger example. So we split into three and then into three again, and I can write it in exactly the same way. I have a vector of all of the series, the total, each of the aggregates and each of the bottom levels, and I can write that as a big summing matrix times the bottom level, the, a vector of the bottom level series. And you can see that the summing matrix um, adds these up. So the first row is just the sum of all of these, the second one, which is the A series, is the sum of the first three, but ignores the rest of them, so it takes these three, and so on. And any hierarchical time series I can write in this manner, Y equals S times B. Okay, so then I come to forecast them, I want to forecast all of the series in the hierarchy, the aggregates as well as the um, bottom level series. If I let my forecasts Y hat be the vector of... Um, a vector of the forecasts made at time n going eight steps ahead and I stack them up in the same order as y. I could have used anything to do these forecasts, any, your favourite forecasting method for each series. 
but done in such a way that you have ignored the hierarchical structure and so they may not add up. Your forecast for the total may not be the sum of the forecast for the bottom level series because you've just applied an algorithm that gave you some, some numbers. So then these need to be reconciled. So the reconciled forecasts then have to add up so that the, the reconciled forecast of the total should be the sum of the reconciled forecasts at the bottom level. Reconciled forecasts are going to have to be of this form. Y tilde is the reconciled one, Y hat is the original forecast that don't add up. So Y tilde must be S times P times Y hat for some matrix P, where P extracts and combines the bottom level forecasts um, and then S adds them up again. If you think about it for a while, this is a general formulation for reconciled forecasts. And there's, there's various ad hoc things that people do in practice when they do reconciliation, but all of them can be written like this. That raises the question, well, what's the, what's the optimal P to make this work as well as possible? Let me just talk briefly about, well, what are the properties of P uh, that we need? One is that it should give us unbiased reconciled forecasts. Um, so, y till, um, so, we, so we need this. We need this uh, to write down that the expected value of y hat uh, is equal to the expected value of the actual data and we also want the same thing for the reconciled forecasts. If the expected value of y hat is equal to the expected value of the future observations, then we, need, then we have this result here. And if we want the reconciled forecast to have the same property, then we need SPS equals S. So that's the first constraint on what P can be. It has to satisfy this property. S times P times S must equal S. The second thing we want is to minimise the variance. Variance of it's relatively easy to write down. It's variance of Y tilde is SP times sigma times P tr transpose S transpose, where sigma is the variance of the bottom level series. So we want to minimise this guy subject to the bias being um, zero. Okay, so here's the, the only theorem you're going to see. For any P satisfying the unbiasedness property, we can minimise the sum of the variances with this result here. It should look familiar to you. It's a projection matrix. Um, it's uh, equivalent to generalised least squares. Okay, where does... Where do we go from here? Well, we need to take our base forecasts, multiply by this P matrix, add them up, and we get our reconciled forecasts. And there's one problem. Sigma is incredibly hard to estimate. We have no idea what it is. It's the variance of our bottom level forecast. We generated those bottom level forecasts from some algorithm. We don't know what the variance of the forecast is, besides which if I have a million time series that I'm forecasting, then this matrix is a million by a million or, or more when I add in the aggregates. And so you can't even estimate it very well. So that's, that's a problem. OK, so what are we going to do about it? Well, solution number one is we could forget about the fact that we have all these covariances and just replace this GLS-like formulation with something that's OLS. In fact, we can do something slightly better than that. If we assume that the bottom level forecast errors add up in the same way that the forecasts should and that the series should, then it turns out that the... Um, and, and then we take a more Penrose inverse, then it turns out that the GLS collapses to OLS, which is sort of magical and happens occasionally that GLS equals OLS um, generalised least squares equals ordinary least squares under some conditions, and it turns out that this is one of those conditions. OK, but that's probably not true. This was, the referees on the paper that, where this appeared said this was a heroic assumption, which I argued with them and it did get published, but in hindsight, maybe it is a little heroic. Um, so that's solution number one. It works, um, but it's uh, not optimal. What else could we do? Well, we could suppose we could approximate this sigma h by something diagonal. This is an H-step forecast covariance matrix. If I approximated it by, well, at least the first one, one step ahead forecast variant, variances, and just took the variances and forget about the covariances, then I can estimate that OK. Um, and so if I did that, then maybe I'll get better results. 
turns out that this works really well. It gives better forecasts than any other available methods that we've ever tried. And it gives us a way of getting um, reconciled forecasts. Okay, so that's sort of the theory bit. How do you reconcile these large sets of forecasts? Now I want to think a little bit about the big data side of this question. If I have, if y hat is, a, is more than a million in length, um, then there's some big matrices happening here. So S prime lambda, lambda being the inverse variances of my base forecasts, and S prime lambda S is something huge, more than a million by a million, and inverting something that big is, is a problem. So we need to, need to somehow solve this. There's going to be computational difficulties whenever the hierarchy gets very big due to the size of the S matrix. And also this thing is, is, non, is, is going to be singular um, because there's redundancies in there, in the, in the aggregation. There's also a loss of information in ignoring the covariance matrix, which I'm prepared to live with for the moment. And, but if I wanted to do prediction intervals, which as a forecaster, you should always do prediction intervals, just to tell people you don't actually know the answer. Trouble with being a forecaster is everyone thinks once you've produced a forecast that you believe it. Um, because you never believe your forecast, they're only your best estimate of the future mean, and it always comes with an uncertainty. Uh, and one of the nice ways of conveying that uncertainty is you give them a prediction interval. If I want to produce a prediction interval here, I need to know what that covariance matrix is, and I don't. OK, so let's ignore, put aside those problems. Let's see if we can try this idea out on a smallish data set where the computational speed doesn't matter very much, which is the Australian tourism data, because it's only 300 or so series. So um, we take the same data set we saw before, divide it into all these states and then zones and then regions, and I do some forecasts. I'm going to use uh, exponential smoothing models, the ETS framework of models for um, predicting each of the series in the hierarchy, just to show you what it looks like. Now, the reason I'm doing that is it's extremely fast and it's very, completely automatic and it works for a lot of different types of time series. So if I took just the total, total visitor nights looks like this and there's my automatic forecasts. That's for New South Wales, that's for Victoria, that's for the northern coast of New South Wales, metropolitan Queensland, southern part of Western Australia, one region within Melbourne, and so on. So you can apply, you can throw the data at this algorithm and it gives you back some forecasts relatively quickly. The regions, the grey shaded regions in these graphs have been the 80% prediction regions. Very small part of Victoria, tiny little place in Queensland, I think, and so on. So. That's the base forecast. We just, every time series, generate forecasts independently, ignoring any relationships that might exist, only taking the, time seri the univariate time series on their own. Then we um, reconcile them. So the, um, what we've got here is that the, the blue line is the original data, the red line is the reconciled forecasts. So they're shifting just as small as possible but so that you get reconciliation, so that the aggregate forecasts add up to the disaggregate forecasts. And so on. So you can see it doesn't make a huge difference, but it makes a big difference when you're doing budget preparation because you want to make sure that you're allocating money that adds up to the money that's going to the lower levels of the organisation. OK, does it work? Does it actually help in forecasting to do this? OK, let's try it out. We could select... Um, what we've done is we took all of the data and we used a rolling forecast origin. That is, we forecast using a subset of the data and then um, calculated the error on the out of sample bit and then we roll it forward and we forecast using one more observation. Training set increases by one observation and uh, we forecast out of sample. And we continue to do that one observation at a time, re-estimating the models and generating the forecasts. So we end up with 24 one step ahead forecasts, 23 two step aheads and so on and we average them um, according to mean absolute percentage error, and we see what, is, what works. So here's, um, we just look at this column down here. So I've taken eight, eight step ahead forecasts, 
We've used three different types of forecast method. Bottom up, which means you just forecast at the bottom level and aggregate, and, ignore, and, and so your forecast at the top level is by definition reconciled because it's just the added up versions of the ones below. That actually works quite well for data like this, but it's hopeless when you disaggregate too far because you end up with time series that are extremely noisy with lots of zeros and you can't actually, once you disaggregate far enough, bottom up will cease to work. OLS and then uh, weighted least squares. And so you can see in the bottom region, weighted least squares works better everywhere and in the zones and in the states. And by the time you get to the top level, so that's just a single series, the whole of Australia, it's sl slightly worse than OLS, but it's not significantly different, whereas these are significantly different. So it does help. It helps with the forecast accuracy to do this reconciliation thing. If you're borrowing strength, you're using the higher level series to help you with understanding and forecasting the lower level series. OK, but that was with 300 series. If I have um, matrices that are more than a million by a million, I can't actually just apply it in the most obvious manner. So let me tell you about how we might deal with that. So here's a hierarchy in the same way I wrote it down before. This is exactly the same slide you saw previously, where we've split by three, and then each of these nodes gets split by three. And then I've written it down in this order, the total, then the three subtotals, and then the nine disaggregated ones. But I don't have to write it in that order. I could rearrange the matrix like so. In this case, I've written, do you even notice there was a change there? That was my first one. And I've just, all I've done is reordered the column, reordered these rows. So now I've got the total, and then I've got these three, this one, this one, this one, this one, and then I go here, this one, and then these three, and then this one, and these three. And the reason for writing it like that is it preserves the, 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 the recursive tree structure of the hierarchy. And so this little block here looks itself like a summing matrix. And this little block here also looks like a summing matrix, and so does this one. So I've got the trees in order. Because there's nothing, there's nothing um, sort of canonical about the ordering that you, you write these things in. So when you write it like that, you can think of the tree as a tree of trees. So you've got a total and then you've got some trees and each of these is itself a tree that disaggregates down. And so then the summing matrix contains k smaller summing matrices. So if I call the, these k if each of those k, k trees has a summing matrix, then these are block diagonals here. And then the first row was just ones, but underneath that is, is, has this structure. And each of these will also have that structure, and so on, down to as much as you wish to disaggregate. OK. Then the things that I need to do my uh, reconciliation are I need s prime lambda s. Um, and then I need to invert it. So S prime lambda S looks like this, which also has this nice block structure where each of these has the same structure as this, plus this little bit on the end, which is um, lambda zero, the top left element of my um, lambda matrix, plus a matrix times a matrix of ones. And I need to invert that. This is where the linear algebra you learnt years and years ago comes in useful. Um, so the Sherman-Morrison formula applied to that means that I can now invert S prime lambda S inverse and I get this structure minus this. And S0 is itself blocked um, where the blocks have, um, have terms that involve these same bits here. And so this is a recursive block structure as well. And then I can apply it recursively and I can invert the thing without ever actually storing any of the matrices. I can do the same thing with S prime lambda Y, which is the other part of the, should be Y hat, which is the other part of the generalized least squares regression. And, uh, and I can get the, uh, the reconciled forecast without ever storing any of the large matrices. Okay, so Bottom line is the recursive calculations can be done in such a way that we never store any of the large matrices involved. You only need to do it recursively on these block structures. That works for hierarchical data. 
I haven't actually talked anything about grouped time series data, but um, not all disaggregation is hierarchical. Some disaggregation is, um, is non-hierarchical. An example of that is um, in the tourism data, I, I also use purpose of travel as a disaggregation factor, but that's not naturally hierarchical within the geography. Okay, geography is naturally hierarchical, but the purpose of travel, I could have split by that first and then by the geography, or I could split by geography first and then by the purpose of travel. So it's not a naturally hierarchical variable, and in that case you have the summing matrix looks a little bit different, and then the previous recursive algorithm is not going to work. We have developed some similar algorithms when you've got two groups that are non-hierarchical, but otherwise, in the more general case, we need to use, um, you, we do need to store the matrices, and then you can use sparse matrix storage, sparse arithmetic, and use an iterative approach for approximating, for inverting large sparse matrices. And it works relatively fast. So let me show you an example. If I switch over to R. Let me just clean that off. So this is all implemented in a package called HTS, which is a, stands for hierarchical time series. Um, I'm going to generate uh, some, some data randomly. Let me just show you what it looks like. So I've got, um, I'm forecasting 12 steps ahead and I have a million time series. I've generated this randomly rather than actually compute a million forecasts because that's the slow bit. For Running a million forecasts will take quite some time in the, in the order of hours. Um, what I want to do is to reconcile them, which is the algorithm that I've just described, and the reconciliation can be done relatively quickly. So assuming this matrix FC is of some forecasts, this, these two lines here, oops, these two lines here will do the reconciliation. Um, so that's just running there now. What, let me explain what it's doing. So it's got a whole lot of forecasts that don't add up appropriately and it's trying to find the um, solution which reconciles them with the smallest possible movements in every series so that they then add up according to the hierarchy. By the way, the hierarchy is, is quite large here. We have four nodes and each of those are split into five and each of those are split into another five. Each of those are split into ten and each of those are split into 100, and each of those are split into 9. So it's a very big, um, large hierarchy with, at the bottom level, um, well, actually in total, it's got about a, a million series. The bottom level has about um, 900,000. Um, okay, done. So that took um, 38 seconds on this little laptop which doesn't have very much memory. So reconciling huge lots of time series is now quite quick to, using these algorithms that we're working on. The, the slow bit, as I said, is generating the forecast in the first place, which is not yet quick, but hopefully uh, it will be. So I was demonstrating that using the HTS package for R, um, which is available on CRAN. Um, the, uh, let me acknowledge my two co-authors that helped with this package, Iro Wang, who was a... Um, on a student working uh, with me, um, extremely talented programmer, and Alan Lee, who's a professor of statistics at, at Auckland University, who spotted the, uh, the hierarchical block structure of the S matrix and, and did a lot of the mathematics to, to figure that out. Um, it's easy to use. So if this is your hierarchy, then you specify it by just saying split by two nodes and then each of these nodes is split into three and two. So you can specify your hierarchy easily. The series that you give it is the bottom level series. It can figure out the aggregations. Then all you do is pass the hierarchical time series object to the forecast function, and it will do all of that for you, um, and do the reconciliation and, and come back with the, with the results. Um, so that's lots of the arguments. You probably don't want to see them. Okay. Finally, let me just uh, mention the, um, the main places where this work has appeared. The, um, the first work we did on this was in CSDA a few years ago with um, two of my PhD students, Roman Ahmed and Hanlin Shang, and my colleague, George Thanasopoulos. Then the, uh, the reconciliation computational thing was in a, 
paper that's uh, under submission at the moment with Alan Lee and Ira Wang in the package. And the other thing I wanted to mention was this book, um, online free open source book, where, which includes a section on hierarchical forecasting, but also discusses lots of other forecasting in the forecast package for R. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, there's a couple of things there. First, we really do want prediction intervals. Um, and to do that, we need, in, in my approach, I'll come to them in the quantile approach as, as an alternative, but in my approach, we need to estimate that covariance matrix. And I do have a PhD student who's making very good progress on that. And hopefully, um, in the next six to 12 months, I might be able to give a talk on how to do prediction intervals using by estimating this covariance matrix. Um, obviously it's huge and it's sparse and it's, and it's reduced rank and so on. So there's a few things you need to do to estimate it, but we're, we're making some progress. There could be alternative ways of, um, of, of getting prediction intervals, for example, using quantiles. The trouble is quantiles don't add up. Um, so not even medians add up. Um, across hierarchy. You don't expect the, me the median of a sum to be the sum of the median. So it's hard to know how to impose that constraint. Whereas at least means add up appropriately. So if you assume things are normal and you're interested in aggregating means, then it's a relatively straightforward problem. If you're trying to look at the constraints that would be required for quantiles, I'm not even sure how to write those down because quantiles are not additive. Um, I've thought a lot about forecasting ensembles in other contexts. Um, in, in generally, um, forecasting uh, ensembles is useful because you, you gain strength by forecasting lots of variations of your, of your series and then you, you, know, you, you, reduce the bar, you reduce the variance and so on. Um, when you've got a million series, multiplying the problem up a little bit more by having ensembles seems to be... <laughs> becoming a little even more challenging. So I haven't thought about it in this context simply because the size of the problem is big enough for me as it is.